this is a slider that is like what you would have found on an old time radio. But this one's funny because it's tilted. And the tilting is actually, it reflects a force of gravity, which I'm going to talk about. Now you can have the, the slider all the way up to the productivity end. And, and we've got a real range of people here, which is what's so exciting about the squadron. And uh, some of you are at quite uh, small organizations and you might remember the time when it was two or three of you, and maybe you're still at that stage and you could be super productive. You didn't have to worry about being accountable to anybody. You could just turn the number all, turn the dial all the way up to 11, shove the slider all the way up to productivity end. That's like uh, Jobs and Wozniak in the garage in 1977 or whatever it was, building the Apple one, right? No accountability, didn't have to um, be predictable for anyone just going to do the next exciting thing and get something out the door. It's a lot of fun, doesn't scale at all, right? There's another end, and that end is like NASA. So NASA has to launch the rocket at exactly the right millisecond so that the moon or the asteroid or whatever it is, is in the right place, right? So predictability is extremely important to them, to even a, a higher level than Roland said, right? Roland said people want to know morning or afternoon. Uh, uh, um, astronauts want to know, is it going to be at 457 or 458? And it makes a big difference whether you get to the planet you're headed to. So NASA engineers have very low productivity. In fact, if you go look up the statistics, they produce around 100 to 200 lines of code per year per developer. So incredibly low levels of productivity, but very high levels of predictability. Most people are somewhere in the middle. And uh, the question is, where should you be? Where do you want to have your slider? Roland, I'm still picking on him because he, he gave such a beautiful example, uh, uh, is at a very uh, probably too predictable end of the slider. He'd like to move the slider up toward more productivity from how he was asking his question, because uh, he's finding that uh, people are asking him for a level of predictability that doesn't make any sense. They're trying to shove the, the slider down. Now, the reason that somebody might shove the slider down typically that I see is this force of gravity, which I've labeled here as desire for control. And what often happens, Roland, you tell me if this is your situation, but I predict it is, that somebody says, well, I'm not quite sure about those engineer people. They're going to do this thing and they might not have it done when the marketing people need it. And I need to be really sure that it happens the way it's supposed to. And so I'm going to tighten up the control. I'm going to have people do more. I'm going to try to get more understanding of what's happening. Maybe they'll tell me it'll be done in August and I'll ask which month, which week in August. And they'll tell me which week and I'll ask which day. And they'll tell me which day and they'll, I'll ask them morning or afternoon. And if I can just get enough control, then I can get the results I want. Roland, does that sound like your situation or am I missing something? Yeah, pretty much. Okay. That's a sign of lack of trust. Because if they had high trust in you, then they would not need to have this level of control. Control is not usually a replacement for trust. And uh, it's a very poor replacement. As all of you know, uh, this kind of uh, level of control, this kind of level of um, uh, uh, predictability, unless you're NASA, is neither necessary nor productive. It doesn't help you to uh, get as much done as you'd like. And, and one of you, I think it was Austin, was saying, um, it, gosh, you're, you're headed off to um, uh, uh, get all kinds of detail, uh, but, uh, and you're not sure it's actually being used very efficiently. So uh, it's not an efficient use of the engineer's time. You're right. Uh, so um, what you're doing there is you're feeding this desire for control. Your organization is feeding this desire for control but the results are that uh, you actually get less done. The Empire State Building was, I think, the tallest building either in the U.S. or, or North America or something like that when it was built. And it was a, a feat of wonderful engineering. Now, of course, it looks rather small against all the others. But at that time in the 1930s, it was a great victory to, to build this um, uh, complex piece of technology uh, physically in the center of New York. And uh, it was planned on a bunch of index cards. And the index cards were in a sort of a card filing cabinet. Um, some of you are probably young enough. Some of you, I see some gray hair. You might remember these in, um, in libraries, these physical card cabinets. And so they had one of these. And they had a bunch of different cards. And they were somehow representing each floor. I don't know the details. And they would shift the cards around. And they would say, OK, well, this delivery came in late. So we're going to move these cards over there. And we'll only work on the 90, 12, 90, 92nd floor next week. And, and on the 91st floor, we can install one of these. And they had um, this very flexible mechanism, kind of like Roland talked about. They didn't know from week to week which part of the building they were going to build. 
And they had an overall picture of when the building would be finished, but they didn't have a uh, specific plan of the type that people who want this, who have this uh, unhealthy desire for control want, where they would know on August the 92nd, this is what we will be doing. And at 4 p.m., uh, we will uh, complete this activity. And in fact, one of the great stories about the Empire State Building is somebody else built a building that was a little bit taller. Um, and they kind of stole a march on on uh, the Empire State Building people. They said, oh, don't worry. Uh, we have more space in the card cabinet, so we can add some more cards. And so they actually added floors to it and added a kind of a needle thing at the top and did, did extra stuff so that it would actually be the tallest building. Uh, and they were able to be flexible in that way because they had this flexible way of building. What do we do about uh, trade-offs? And what can I tell people I'm not going to do today so that I can do something else? And, and what will that, um, how will that affect the overall plan? How will that affect what people get? Perfectly valid, uh, uh, fantastic question. The trick is, um, though there's several tricks, but one of them is uh, to keep the unit of work as small as possible. So uh, I bet you know, if I asked you to, to change what your team did tomorrow, Friday, I bet you would be able to say what they're not going to do tomorrow, just for one day. Is that true or uh, is that not yeah. true, Austin? Yeah, th yeah. Okay. So if the unit is small, then you can answer the question. It's when you start saying, well, I'm going to cancel this entire piece of the project. I'm going to cancel a month's worth of work and I'm going to put it into something else. That's when it becomes much more difficult to say, okay, well, that it then has this dependency and this other bit over here. So part of the trick is to keep the pieces as small as possible. So the um, it's as if you're building with Lego bricks instead of brick bricks, right? If you have Lego bricks, you can kind of fit them around much more easily. You can, can move them uh, about. And, and that happens in software as well. If you don't roadmap, if I don't use a tool to roadmap, I never get that technical debt done. I never get that chance to be efficient. Can, because... can I tell you a secret, Austin? Please, please. Yeah, that's why I'm you're here. Never, you're never going to get it done. <laughs> no, and I really mean that. Uh, I have been trying to get, uh, <laughs> for many, many years, I've been trying to get somebody in the business to prioritize technical debt as technical debt or to uh, prioritize an improvement in deployment or added testing or anything like that. That th They are never going to buy that. And the reason I can tell you is because like it's not right. in it's not in business terms. No. People will buy the action. If the action is, for example, add tests so that um, uh, our customers stop complaining about bugs in the software, then we're getting a lot further. If I can trade off against um, uh, uh, an increased conversion rate, then I've really got somebody's attention. Increased conversion rate may come through adding more tests so that the software is higher quality, so fewer fewer people slip out of the funnel, right? People tune to the new channel and say, okay, well, actually the program I expect to be here is here and it's really interesting and inviting and I want to stick around. People who are in, interested in pro project uh, and product prioritization are responsive to those kind of business cases. They're not responsive to, I'd like to make things better for my team. So, um, uh, you're in, introducing, putting it on the roadmap doesn't help you. My dog may be excited, but it's, it still doesn't help you. No matter how much she barks, it's not going to get better. And I can tell you if after 25 years of doing this, that has never worked for me. I've never been able to say, I'm going to put this on the roadmap. I'm going to take 20% of my time. I'm going to work on this helpful thing, which is a good idea. No matter how good an argument I have for it, no matter how convincing I am about it, I'm not getting anywhere with it. So what's the alternative the alternative is to um, make sure, first of all, that you have a business-based reason for doing the action that you're interested in doing, and that you have a good way to be accountable for it. And that's what I'm going to get into. So I'm going to talk about an alternative, several alternatives to roadmaps. had a client who had a marketing department who were doing all this desire for control stuff. They were saying, look, I have to know that it's on March the 4th. I have to know if it's in the morning and I have to make sure that this set of features is working exactly this way on March the 4th. And the leader came back to me and said, Squirrel, you know, you're supposed to be helping me with all this more flexible development and elephant carpaccio and delivering rapidly. And 
you know, these folks are just telling me it has to be March the 4th with all these things. They're giving me a fixed scope. And I said, go find out from the marketing department why they need that, because it's really strange. Marketing would want that, right? What marketing usually just cares about what they can blog about and what they can promote. Why do they care about exactly which day? Find out. He comes back and he says, well, they, they have to know this because they, they have to know uh, which day to buy the balloons on. And I said, balloons? This company did sort of enterprise data, right? They were doing data about companies and so on. So uh, uh, sort of research material, nothing to do with balloons. And so I said, what's the, what's the deal with the balloons? And they said, well, we're having a major marketing event. We're bringing all of our cu current customers and prospects together and we're getting balloons and food and stuff. And we're going to show off the new version of the software. And I said, wait a minute, did you ask them um, what they actually have to show at the event? This is quite complex software. You can query it for all kinds of things and, you know, dances and sings and it does, uh, uh, washes your socks and does everything. And you're really going to do all that in the demo? They said, no, no, no. All we're going to do is take them through these three steps. We're going to show them the new API and that's done. And, and so the lead said, well, wait a minute, it already does that. We already have software that does that. Now, it breaks a lot and it has bugs and things, but as long as you do the right stuff, you can demo it. And it'll take these guys six months to implement it in their companies anyway, by which time we'll have it definitely finished. So what they were able to do was to make a very firm promise to marketing. You can buy the balloons. It's okay. Buy them. It's great. Have the event. We're going to show up and we'll have a demo because we have it now. Right? The demo works, but that we won't have worked out all the bugs in the software. We won't have had the dialogue with the customer. We won't have worked out um, all of the uh, documentation and so on, but they don't care because we can show them that it has the capacity that they're looking for and that will make the difference. So very often you can find out what the actual business need. And here it was, buy balloons, have event, make customers excited. Uh, and if you can meet that business need, you can almost always make a firm promise you'll meet the need, but not how. There's a key uh, item that you use when you land an airplane. It's called a glide path indicator. And the glide path indicator has a little picture of a plane. It's kind of the, the as if you were looking at the back of the from the back of the plane at the plane, and um, uh, it shows you whether you are too high. The airplane goes too high above a kind of line that's there, or you're too low. And if you're too high, then you're going to overshoot the runway. You're going to you're going to keep going too far, and you're going to go into the trees beyond the runway. And if you uh, are too short, uh, if you're too low, then that means you're you're coming down too fast. You're going to crash before you hit the runway. And where you want to be is right on the line. Now, when I have people create glide paths, and I, I have a client working on this right now, uh, he's created a strategic glide path for his technology team for the next year. And uh, what he has is various stages at which he knows that the team needs to be here in order to wind up on the runway at the, at the ultimate result that the, that the team is going to produce. Um, in his case, uh, that's uh, expanding the number of integrations that he has. He has a lot of enterprise customers, like some of you, and uh, he's got to integrate with a lot of their software. Fun, exciting things like SAP, you know, most fun in the world to integrate with. So uh, he's got to get those done. He's not sure which order he's going to do them all in. He's not sure how long each one's going to take, but he knows what the stages are. I've got to have, if I'm going to have 10 integrations by next year, then I need to have three this month and I need to have uh, five at the end of uh, uh, September and I need to have seven at the end of November and so on. So he has a mechanism for, for people tracking where they are. And he expects and he sets the expectation with the rest of the company. This is why the glide path um, analogy is helpful. Because Austin, when you landed the plane, I bet the glide path indicator was never right on. You're always kind of going a little bit up and a little bit down, and a little bit up and a little bit down. You're never quite where you want to be. And that's normal. That's what you should expect to have happen. But you had accountability in the form of the, the indicator. And again, this is where being visible to your customers, showing them what the results are all the time can help you. Because you keep showing them and say, well, here's our glide path that we agreed. And, and we knew that we'd be here. But you know what? I only have two integrations done. I'm really stuck here. I need help. Uh, here's how I'm going to recover. This is how I'm pulling back on the stick. I'm going to be moving us up so we don't crash. And uh, um, uh, next uh, week or month or whatever it is, when I come back to you, I'm going to show you the glide path again. We're going to see where we are. This melts away the desire for control. It really reduces when people can see what's happening today. We don't actually do sprints, but once a fortnight, we do a how progress do? update. Yep. What we're not doing in those is showing working software. Uh -huh. and I think that's the thing we need to do. Absolutely, because that just changes the dialogue hugely because people can see that it's actually happening. And when you see this kind of charts and graphs and nifty stuff and, and good summaries, I mean, that's all brilliant stuff. I'm not saying that people are doing a, a bad thing. They're doing an unproductive thing. The most productive thing is to show this is what we've got so far. 
We want your feedback. And that really changes the dialogue. Um, the other thing that I'll just suggest, because sometimes that doesn't work, sometimes there's an additional piece uh, and, and there's a further um, misalignment of some variety. Uh, the person's been burned before. Um, they see that there's not delivery in another place. Um, uh, they're concerned about something. They want uh, lower risk. They want to be more certain. They, uh, they'd like to have but for, for an external reason, like um, uh, their regulator is going to come beat them up or something like that. And finding out that underlying reason for the lack of trust is hugely important. So the other thing I'd suggest in addition to working software is go have what I call a trust conversation where you align your stories. Uh, I have a technique called test-driven development for people. Maybe I'll do a session on that again sometime soon, but it's in chapter three of Agile Conversations and such. But um, uh, having a discussion with them about why they um, uh, continue to not trust you and what their story is. How are they getting from observing in the, when you do this, working software and results and a glide path that you're on and still asking for more results, more more certainty, more information, uh, that's, that's really useful. That happens sometimes, but usually for an external reason. I'm wondering if there's a two-way trust issue here as well. It's mm -hmm. not that they don't trust us, it's that we don't also trust them to be giving us good guidance and good direction. Mm, so I like it. Tell me more. Well, I feel that the, the people that come in with requests um, to us often don't actually understand the business value of their requests very well. And if we don't question it, then we get overwhelmed with a lot of requests that we don't understand the business value of. Um, so, so then we, we get less trust on the other way as well. And we trust our leaders to not be guiding us in the right direction, not be protecting yep. us from multiple different uh, conflicting priorities. Um, so yeah, I feel like that's an issue in our situation. Well, I really appreciate, first of all, your candor in describing that. And secondly, the insight, uh, which I think is really valuable. The mistrust the other direction is a key element because what's happening there is a defensive reaction. The team says there's lots of um, amorphous, vague, unclear requirements and demands and requests coming in. And what we need to do, I've often heard this, and I hate this analogy, I hate this way of thinking about it, that your manager should be an umbrella. Your manager puts up the umbrella and stops all those requests and then shelters the team from this um, incoming onslaught. And they're like, oh, man, they won't get hit by the hailstones that are coming down and crashing into their heads. And when you make the analogy that way, it sounds great. The actual situation is you've got confused customers. You've got people who need stuff and don't have the language or the access or the uh, uh, knowledge to give it to you. That's a different problem. And it's a really important problem. The, and the most important and helpful thing would be for to take the umbrella away and to make sure that there's direct interaction so that the team can understand and we can resolve whatever the confusion is. Because for example, what often happens when you get a glide path in place, like the, the series of integrations that I was talking about for my client, is that then gives everybody a common language and they can say, well, what I'd like you to do is to take out the integration with SAP and all the engineers dance and sing. And they say, I'd like you to do an integration with Jira. And then they cry. Um, so uh, the, the, um, <laughs> Adam, Adam knows this situation. He's done that. So um, the, the, uh, but what's clear is that then the request makes sense. It's fitting into a framework. It's fitting into common language. Um, the uh, domain-driven design people call this an ubiquitous language. And it really means outside the technology team, people have a way to discuss it. So if you have that kind of problem, the solution isn't to shelter the team and to have more process and more decision-making and, and more graphs and Moscow charts and other things. Um, it, the solution is to understand the actual issue. I had that coming up today. I, um, person I'm coaching said, uh, oh yeah, we're going to deal with that problem. We're, we're not worried about it. Uh, we're, we're going to just create these Moscow uh, must, should, can, I forget what the things are, the, these metrics. And that's how we're going to rate everything. And then we'll know which thing to do. I said, that's not your problem. Your problem is that the people on the other end don't understand what they're talking about or and don't have a way to describe it to you and get unconfused. So putting them through more process, adding up more numbers, um, having more um, uh, bureaucracy and um, discussion is a way for you, as, just exactly as you were saying, Russ, very helpfully, it's a way for you to get more control. And that doesn't help. So if you take nothing else away from this, uh, think when you're looking at a roadmap or you're looking at a process like that, um, the, the person that you're talking to is probably looking for control. And the most helpful thing is get rid of that control.
The most helpful thing is to remove that kind of artificial desire for control and replace it with greater accountability, um, such as with a, a, um, a, a glide path that tells you, here are the stages I'm at, here's where I'm against those stages, and here's some working software that shows you that I'm there.